When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hi, everybody. I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hello, Donald. How are you? What's I'm swell. And yourself? I'm good. Are you? I'm terrific. Yeah. You feeling peppy? Well, I had I I <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm no. Yeah. I'm not peppy. No. I know. <laughs> just, <laughs> just thought I'd throw that out there and see if you'd be peppy today. <laughs> well, I I normally am peppy, but yeah. I had a, my flu shot yesterday, so I don't feel particularly peppy, but I'm trying. No. That, thus, yeah. my, my gallon of, of caffeine loaded. Nice. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to wait like to I get do. the flu shot till... I know I shouldn't wait. Maybe till Monday. I have to play golf in the morning yeah, on golfing. Monday. And I have to get up super early. Yeah. So I'm not going to get my flu shot till then. I'm going to ask our guest today if that's a really good idea or a really stupid idea. Because <laughs> I know the answer to that. Because <laughs> you're a very sensitive soul. I am. You and, are. And, you know, and I feel like uh, I need to be peppy at all times. But, uh, well, your your uh, non-peppy is the average person's peppy. So we're good to go. Look at that. No one's Any ever exciting? said the word peppy that many times <laughs> on air I'm or anywhere. Peppy. I'm bringing peppy back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, it's like uh, a pippa. Uh, I'm like a real pippa, uh, aren't I? You are. A peppy Just pippa. Just like that. Look at that. It's got gams. <laughs> you can't see my gams, but they're there. <laughs> So anything exciting to report or should we just jump in? We should jump in because we have, I have so many questions for our guest. And, you do. Um, yeah. You have a lot of words to say, don't you? I have words to say and words to ask. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I like it. Yeah. So go, go on I'll, and introduce our lovely guest, Donald. I will do that. So Dr. Brittany Lamb is an ER physician, dementia family caregiver, educator, and advocate. She helps medical decision-making caregivers make confident and informed decisions on their person's behalf through anticipation and planning. Her enlightening services include such matters as advanced directives, planning for medical emergencies, how to talk to your family, and determining goals of care, just to name a few. So if you are someone's power of attorney, healthcare proxy, surrogate, or default decision-maker, Dr. Lamb can help create a plan on how you will make your future medical decisions so you can focus on spending quality time with your loved one. And after all, that is what it's all about, is it not? So let's not wait another moment and say hello to Dr. Brittany Lamb. Hi, <laughs> should we call you doctor or Br- should we be oh, Dr. Can- Brittany? <laughs> oh my gosh, just call me Brittany. It's totally fine. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Not Lammy Thank Pie, you for having- <laughs> yeah, not Lammy Listen, Pie. <laughs> it would not be the first time that someone's called me Lammy Pie. <laughs> okay, we so want to call you Lammy Pie. <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking about respond. it since yesterday. Yes, yeah, so we've, been, we've been talking about it since yesterday. We're like, God, God if we could only call her Lammy, Lammy Pie. Lammy Pie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on and what you do and your experience and your perspective of what you do and what you've seen and how you feel changes should be made so resonate with what I've just been through in the first half of this year. And I'm sure almost everybody that's listening will have, have or will have this experience because it's part of life and it's part of, and it's a big part of the life that we don't have any idea of until we're deep in it, until we're knee deep in it. And um, like you say, that is the worst time to make decisions. <laughs> Yeah. So let let's get a little background on you first, so we can understand, so everyone can understand how cool you are and how how bright and, <laughs> and awesome. Um, you you know you started as an ER doctor. Tell us about that. I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. I had no idea what kind of doctor I was going to be, but I was very interested when I went through all the process in medical school. That's I wound up being an ER doctor. So um, I've been working in the ER for almost a decade now. Um, and uh, I, I, 
in my personal life, I think maybe people would want to know why I got into the dementia space, you know. Um, my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up. She had vascular dementia. She was just with us when I was in high school, uh, my father's mother. And uh, that was my first experience ever being around someone who had dementia. Um, and so it was very eye-opening for me seeing how it impacted her life and then, you know, also the people around her. So her, her spouse, my grandfather, and then my dad and my mom even, you know, and the interactions between all of them providing care and making decisions. And, you know, and she, they also have, uh, they had seven kids. So, you know, all the different children weighing in and everything. So, um, but yeah, so then I went to college and I did some volunteer work with uh, a, a, a um, community that kind of brought uh, college students that are interested in going to medical school together with someone living with dementia. So I hung out with this guy who had uh, dementia and I hung out with him in his assisted living facility. So that was another experience that I had. And um, what? Wait, wait, this... wait, 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 yeah. wait, go back yeah. to that. So you hung out with yeah. this guy with dementia, yeah. like, like yeah, you do, just... like you do. Yeah. Okay. You need to extrapolate that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, he was actually, I, I honestly, I can't remember his name. It was a really long time ago, but, um, he was an actuary for Geico and so, so smart. And I would sit with him and we would do crossword puzzles, like at his assisted living on his back porch, you know, that was secure and everything and I, I just hung out with him I got to know his family I went over to their house for dinner you know and this was when I was in this was when I was in college so before I went to school or to medical school so um I just think that uh I don't know I mean I enjoyed spending time with him and getting to kind of know what it was like in an assisted living facility also you know like I never yeah. really even been in been in one at that point in my life so um so a little bit of real world experience there. I, I really liked hanging out with him, you know. Uh, it just he taught me a lot. I mean, he was a very knowledgeable person. And I've always enjoyed spending time with people who are older than me because, you know, you have so much wisdom and knowledge that you can pass on to people who are younger. And so I've always enjoyed spending time with people who are aging, essentially. Um, but when I, uh, when I was in medical school, I did research on advanced directives. And so the post form was something that I was super passionate about and still am um, and worked on that. And I, it's just always mattered to me that people receive care that they actually want. And I think that if you don't understand the diseases themselves and if you don't understand the treatment options for them, you can't make informed choices. And so... This all of these culminations of like my personal experience have kind of living, brought me to this point in my life where I just keep seeing aging people in the emergency department come in who are really sick and who cannot speak for themselves, who then need help making choices and their families are very overwhelmed because they were never talked about about what their diseases were like or what it looked like when they got worse or what the treatment options were. And this is for people who, everybody, for all comers, not just people living with dementia. It's a huge problem for all aging folks. But for those who are living with dementia, there's a special opportunity, which, I mean, it kind of sounds bad saying it like that, but because you know that that person will lose the ability to make their own choices, it does allow you to plan in advance for the choices that you might make. Mm -hmm. And you can decrease stress as a caregiver by doing so. So that is like... My entire mission in coming online and doing this work is I want to offload the stress from caregivers when it comes to medical decision making and planning for their person's future so that they can really spend the time with their person, like providing day to day care and just enjoying being with them um, because they still have so much to give. Totally. So. I love it. I love it. I'm applauding you so much because I, I am I am your poster child for what not to do. And, you know, and, and we, you know, we had a, I, my mom didn't really have a directive before. And it was, you know, I really loved my mom a lot. We, she had a living will, a, a trust, but, but that was, that's a different story. I, I was her conservator of person. So I was her health, her health surrogate. And um, I had to make a decision on her directive. I didn't even know what a directive was. And I went with my gut, which was, you know, I wanted her at full code because I thought uh, I wanted to be the one to make that decision. I never wanted her to be taken into a hospital and someone else make that decision for me or make, you know, a decision that was too important. I needed to see my mom. And because she has Alzheimer's and because she can't communicate for herself, 
may, you know, she, she needed someone else to communicate and look at her and actually be able to communicate with her to see where, where she really was at physically and emotionally. So, um, but, but still like what you said, it's, it's, it, it changed over the past six months for me. I had to, uh, decide, do I want to keep her at full code? Cause I finally got educated on what full code is, which you talk about, which is, you know, CPR, which is, which is aggressive. And, yes. and, um, I certainly didn't want that. So can you discuss maybe like what the two, dif the different kinds of directives that are, that we have choices to, to make? Let me back up a little bit. So advanced okay. directives are document or legal documents and the person who has been diagnosed with dementia has to do those on their own. So a living will deciding who their surrogate is, um, they have, while the person still is able to make their own decisions and still has capacity and legally, that's called competency, they can fill out those forms and kind of can direct some of their health care in advance through these documents. Um, so, and then there, in, in each state, there is a process for like who would become someone's legal health care decision maker if they didn't name someone. And so it's different, a little bit different in each state, but normally it's like a spouse and then, a, you know, and then a child. Um, and sometimes it's a parent if they're still alive. But anyway, um, so there is a default decision maker that will happen per state. But so advanced directives have to be done in advance and they have to be done when a person's still able to make their own decisions. Um, and I have a huge bone to pick with advanced directives because they do not tell, they're not specific, which is this, the issue. They're not meant to be specific. You know, they're drafted by lawyers, by attorneys, by people who do not practice medicine. So they're not, they don't tell me what to do in the emergency department. And this is kind of why I jumped into this space is because I do believe that the issues that come up in dementia, I think that what you choose to do from a medical standpoint should change, should can and should potentially change depending on the actual medical condition that is happening. So in some circumstances, you may want more aggressive care because perhaps that person is very likely to recover or maintain their current quality of life, like especially from an infection. Like, okay, maybe we're going to treat that aggressively and that's okay. But if they have a significant underlying problem like a heart problem or a lung problem that we know is not going to get better, perhaps that person wouldn't want aggressive care in that situation. So anyway, I kind of got off tangent there for a second, but advanced directives are legal documents and then... When you come into the hospital, what you're talking about with code status. So code status is basically like, what do you want us to do if you are to die? And so, and I'm, you know, I'm being very blunt and direct here, right? So CPR, we only use CPR if someone is like actively dying or technically has died. They do not have a pulse and they're not breathing anymore. So mm -hmm. CPR is chest compressions, it's medications through the IV, it is controlling someone's airway with intubating them, putting them on a ventilator in some in some circumstances. And then occasionally we can actually shock people, which people see on TV as shocking people all the time. And that is actually not as common as not being able to shock someone. So um, that's one, when someone comes into the hospital, we're gonna ask you, do you wanna be full code? And that means that we're gonna do CPR and we're gonna put you on a ventilator. And then each hospital has different designations for what they do after that. So there's full code and then there's the other opposite side of that is comfort care. And so usually that's going to be labeled as somebody's going to be a do not resuscitate. So don't do chest compressions, don't do CPR, don't put them on a ventilator, allow natural death. So that's usually what kind of what the language is. And that is somebody who, if that person starts to die and they're becoming unstable, they're, they have unstable vital signs, meaning their blood pressure is really low, their heart rate's really high or really low, they're not getting oxygen, they're not breathing. We're going to keep that person comfortable, but we're not going to do a lot of aggressive measures to try to reverse those things. So that's allow natural, allow natural death. And then there's people in the middle, which they, people that do not want to have CPR, so they are do not resuscitate but they're okay with other aggressive treatments. And then the hospital will help you differentiate, hopefully, which things you are okay with and not. But I'll tell you that having that conversation could take half an hour, and who has half an hour in the hospital to sit down and have this conversation with you? Um, nobody does. And so um, it's, it's, it's a huge problem because it's, it is not complicated. 
I, I don't believe that it's complicated to explain this to people. I think people are very capable of taking in this information and making decisions for themselves. But they have to be given the information in order to make decisions, and we do not have a way to give it to them um, because we don't have enough time in the hospital, and primary care doctors don't have enough time in the like unless you're seeing a concierge physician. You know, um, there just isn't a lot of time. And that's the biggest problem is that sometimes they're asking you, what do you want to do? And you have no idea. You don't have the education. It's like, wait, you're the doctor. Tell me what should be done. <laughs> yeah. You know, do, how many times do I ask the question, what if this was your daughter? What if this, you know, yep. that, that to me is the answer to that. What if this was your loved one? What would yeah, you Yeah, and do? We're, trained not to, we're trained not to do that. <laughs> And so when you ask us that question, we're supposed to, we're not supposed to do that. Um, that's, that's a huge, it's a huge problem because it, you're right. It's like, what do you want to do? That's not the right question. The, mm -hmm. the way that this should be done is this is what's happening. Do you understand what's happening? Okay. These are the options for what we can do going forward, but I need you to understand like what happens if you choose each of those options, because a lot of times people will tell me like, just go ahead and do everything, but then they don't understand like what that means going down the line afterwards. And right. so, and it's hard, it's, it's just hard to deliver the information when you have such little time. You're right. And also it, there's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a, a an e it, it's not a, a simple decision because there's so many other factors that play into each of those decisions. So, you know, there's, there's data and then there's, there's people. So there's data that can give you a sort of general idea of what is happening, what might happen, what could happen, what has happened, maybe. And then there's the reality of that person and really what they're presenting, what does that mean? So, you know, I don't think there's a caregiver that's, that I know that I've talked to who hasn't felt like they've turned into a CNA or, you know, has been, you know, taken on those responsibilities of really trying to, to diagnose and to be an interpreter. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really hard job. And especially when you're emotional and, and especially when you're up against a system that is very rigid and because of, uh, their fear of liability and that becomes oh, yeah. an issue. Yeah. 100%. I think that I think that caregivers that have more knowledge and have done it before um, tend to feel more. I think once you've done this before with someone who's been really sick, it does make it easier for you the next time. But uh, caregivers do wind up learning so much about the healthcare system um, because they have to advocate for their person because they can't speak for themselves anymore. And there's all kinds of issues that come up in problem solving that that's required in doing this job. It is not easy. It is one hundred percent like a very hard job to do that no one wants to do. I mean, exactly. No one wants to be in the situation like this. And there's not, um, not everybody is a Brittany lamb. Not everybody <laughs> is because no, truly, because there's a lot of people in this field that have, uh, who maybe should be out of it. Maybe they're, maybe they've gotten jaded, hardened, um, uh, because they had to, cause it isn't an easy job. And, and they throw big wide nets over everybody and they forget that there's individual human beings that are there and that everybody doesn't every act the same on, on morphine and everybody doesn't always die when their pulse, you know, drops to this level or whatever. You know, everybody has a different, you know, we are unique. And, and we have to remember that when we're diagnosing that, you know, there are there's there's things that happen and I'm not a I'm not a ooey -oo girl I'm not saying that you know let's pray and there's going to be a miracle but I I know you know just that that data is only data and then you mm -hmm. have to have you have to be in there as the caregiver to really really check in and really see is this the base of your person is this you know how are they what is the quality of their life what would they want and and I and can I just throw this out here? I mean, as you will probably recognize this question, but I got this question all the time from the palliative doctors in the hospital who didn't know me. They were just sent to call, call me and say, what would your mom want when she was in her fully copus mentis, you know, state, when she was, you know, before Alzheimer's and everything? And I said, that's not fair. That's not a fair question because 
that person is not the same person anymore. So the person that would say to me, Susie, uh uh uh, don't put me in a place like that. You know, if I get there, well, no, because that person now says, I say, how are you, mom? And she goes, I'm great, I'm alive. She's happy as a clam. So you have to, you can't, you can't make that decision on someone from 20 years ago or 15 years ago. It's not a fair question. It's not I, because they're different. Yeah, I think that what you're saying makes perfect sense. Um, I think that in palliative care training, people are asked to think about that. Like, so they're, you're taught to, to, as the person was when they were fully competent and had capacity, what they say about how they're living right now. But if you recognize in your person that they still have a good quality of life and they would still want their life prolonged, then you are able to speak on their behalf as, as that, as their current quality of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are, there are some people that are um, not as, I don't know how to say this, like not as affected with their personality and from an emotional standpoint negatively with dementia you know right. some people that can still enjoy and you can still see that they're you know happy and that they have like some meaning and purpose and they're still enjoying life like yeah. that's that's one segment of people um and then there are people that are not that are not like that and so if people's quality of life is suffering you know then you know, their loved one may choose to do something differently. But I, I think, I think what you're saying makes sense too. Like, but I, yeah. I think you, I think also like knowing that palliative care are trained, they're trained to come in and ask that question. Like what you're saying is not, is not what you should do. And I, I get both sides of it really. Yeah. It's yeah. Tough. And it really comes down to the, the individual again. That's all I'm saying is that it comes down and you're yes. absolutely right. Set so, like, you know, one of my other colleagues, mother who had dementia at, towards the end, she was like, I'm ready to go. My, they're coming to get me and I'm happy to go. My mom, I don't, wasn't ready to go. You know, she was, you know, she just loved life. So whatever was there, you know, if it was a good meal, if it was snuggling with the babies, it was, that was a good day. If we were singing a song, it was a good day. If she could see a good looking man walk by, it's a great day. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, you know, it that. is, you're right. And you're right because it's like, you know, everybody, some people can um, um, acclimate to where they're at, to what they yeah. have. And, and that, and my mom had that facility. And I know a lot of people that I've met throughout, you know, her journey that were just like her. And I met others that weren't. And, and who, when they were ready to go, they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. And you know it. And, you know, and I think if you're, if you're at all intuitive with your person, then you, you, you can really, they'll communicate that to you and you'll know it. You will yeah. absolutely know it. And no, in doc, I mean, if you, I mean, what do you think about what I'm saying is because, because I think that doctors can only give you the spectrum and then you, they can't make that decision for you. They don't because know you they well don't enough. Know you they well don't know you well enough. <laughs> You are 100% right. And also, I, I have to check in with myself constantly as a physician. Like, I have a bias towards less care. Like, I know that I have that because, and I tell people that. I have a bias towards less care because, and people in the hospital do, because we see people suffering, right? You just see people coming in, coming in. They're, they're sick. They don't feel good. They don't want to talk to you. They're confused. You don't know what they're like when they have a good day. And that's why I'm constantly telling myself and my and the nurses that are working with me, like and when we're taking care of patients, I'm like, we need to know what this person is like when they're not sick. Like, what is their day like? Are they? Are, what is their quality of life like? Would they be okay with that quality of life? Like, and that's that's the the struggle I think that when people work in the ER, when they work in the hospital, nurses, techs, doctors, we all just get so used to seeing people suffer, mm -hmm. and we don't want to hurt them. You know, and what we do to treat people, it's not comfortable. Like, no, it's and, not. And it's it's not comfortable, and they're tough decisions. And you want to make sure what you're doing is what someone would actually want. And 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 so there's this balance there, right? Between like, I don't know what this person is like on a good day, and I have to right. remind myself that I want to seek out that information so that I can help their decision maker make the best choice for them in that moment. And, um, and I think it's tough. I don't think, I think that it's hard for people to do. And I think it's easier. I think it's easier 
just to continue with the standard of care in medicine and to just continue to do things to people and not really question whether or not you should be doing it and then send in the palliative care team to have a conversation with the family. I think that's what winds up happening. Um, right. First, I want to just say, I want to, I just want to say that the best doctors and nurses that I, because my mom did bounce in and out of the hospital the last six months of her life. And that wasn't because I wanted her to, that was because of the, of the situation, facility. the facility, and yeah. it was bad. But the nur- yes. but the emergency nurses who I became friends with we're like, what is going on, Susie? This is your mom's base. Don't they understand? I said, no, they do not understand. And I get called, like, I'll get a call at two in the morning. Your mom is, you know, breathing a bit fast right now. And I go, okay, all right. So what do you want me to do? Well, we don't, you know, we think we should send her to the hospital. You do? Why? Well, you know, they're just so worried. And, and most of it comes from liability. Yes. Worried about their own liability and not the, the, the well-being of their resident. So my mom would get sent back there for no good reason, you know, being transferred in a, in a, in a ambulance. ambulance, the whole thing. Uh-huh. It's just, it's too much. And, and if she wasn't sick before, she is now. Yeah. You know, she's right? out of her routine. She didn't mm-hmm. sleep. She didn't get her medications. Or right. you know, whatever normal care. I know it's it, and then I, yeah. and then intubated is, three times. She was intubated three times, even oh, against. Wow. Yeah, Susie said no more, and then, and they still did it. My mom in in January this year was sent to the hospital with uh, which unbeknownst to me a a, a level four uh, pressure wound in her sacrum. You didn't know about that? No, she wasn't bedridden. She was in a wheelchair. From mm. and that was from Depakote, but that's a whole nother story. That's what put her in the wheelchair. This all happened during COVID, even though you know, and all I could do was was Zoom with her once once a week, which I did, and um, I started to notice that she was in bed when I'm zooming with her at three in the afternoon, right? So then I'm asking why is she in bed? Well, she's tired, or what? Yeah. You know, so I wasn't getting the right. Anyway, she ended up with that, which which turned into which you know brought her into the hospital because of sepsis. Yeah. And then UTI and then low kidney functioning and, um, and pneumonia. I listened to your, the latest episode that you did. I think I missed that. You didn't know that she had that serious of a pressure wound. And now I'm just like, my mind is kind of blown on that. What happened to your mom? Like I see that same situation happening all the time to patients, like the same sequence of events. But I cannot believe they, that they didn't tell you that. She didn't know she, she had any pressure wound, let, a, let alone a level four. There right. was no notification that there was any pressure wound. No, no. And when, you know, and Don and I actually, Don came with me to visit her like 36 hours before she was taken to the hospital. And I noticed that she was, didn't seem right. I mean, she was still responding to me and laughing. I told, you know, I had this whole video actually of her telling, I, I was doing a, a, what I do, a dog and pony show to make her laugh and make her happy. And, yeah. And Don happened to record the whole thing, and you know we noticed. And by the end of it, it was like twelve minutes, and I was doing the life of Norma, you know, and making her laugh. And 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 then uh, Don noticed that she had something flopping around in her mouth, and it was someone's bridge, not hers, someone else's bridge with food on it. And I was oh like, my gosh. oh my god, like that's why it was flopping around because it didn't, it wasn't hers. It didn't fit. Yeah, right. Yeah, she had, oh she had gosh. like, yeah. So I, anyway, so that. And I noticed that she wasn't clean and she, but she was in her chair. So she was sitting in her chair. And still, if you look at, you know, the video, you'll see she's adorable. And she's like responding to me, like I'm going, I'm going right. And she's laughing because I'm telling her how all the men love her. And, you know, I'm doing all that stuff. And so she was having, she was having her life. She was at her base. There was nothing different. And then after, once they got her into the hospital and they had to intubate her, First of all, it was COVID. This was back in January, so it was Omicron. I wasn't allowed in there. And mm-hmm. um, I got a call that they were going to intubate her because of the pneumonia. I mean, I had no choice. They already did it. And then mm-hmm. they, when they tried to extubate her, they did it too soon. So they put mm-hmm. it back in again. Mm-hmm. And then they decided to put a G-tube in because it had been too long and they needed to give her food. Nutrition, and yeah. The nutrition, and then they told, and then they told me it was all temporary. That was just a temporary mm. until they extubated her, and then by the end of that that 
month and a half, she came back to the her facility with the Foley catheter with her G tube, and the, the facility decided that it was better to keep it in because it was less invasive. And but at the end of the day, it was really just easier for them. Yeah, more convenient. It was much more convenient, despite the fact that my mom wanted to eat orally, wanted to drink orally, wasn't aspirating at all, but they decided she oh. was aspirating. Oh. So they would give her nothing, not nothing. not even liquid that's on a sponge. Awful. It's awful. Yeah. I that's that's horrible. <laughs> I mean, I it's inhumane. Yes. I mean, 100%. That's not a quality of life. That's not com providing comfort even, no. you know, especially not if you have, if, especially if she had a swallow study and, and there were measures in place to make sure she wasn't aspirating, you know, like, I mean, if she wasn't aspirating, then that doesn't make sense to me. And to do that out of convenience is like very poor care. Um, exactly. They, I, yeah, they did it under the they did it under the guise that she would aspirate, even though Susie could go in and and give her juices and stuff, and she I would did it be with just it, you fine. Know, with, yeah, with the sponges. They and then with, they for, they stopped her from doing it. And said mm -hmm. no, no, she will aspirate, and she's like, well, she isn't, she doesn't, and Let, they said, mm -hmm. and then after Susie finally talked them into finally letting her do it, they got, but well, they had, none a, they of had staff, someone come in to assess yeah. her finally after seven which weeks. Was done wrong. Who basically <laughs> did it like this with her fingers, uh -huh. and just to test if she was swallowing. And first of all, my mom was like, what are you doing? Like, I'm not going <laughs> to swallow with your fingers there. Yeah. And so I said, she's not going to swallow with your fingers there. And, and, you know, since I found out from, from, really the true speech therapist that that is so antiquated you don't test swallowing that way that's as good as a guess yeah yeah that's as good as a i guess. mean i'm not a speech language i don't do those studies but yeah i mean i have had... to do a barium test you have to do an x-ray there's things that there's a process and the standard that need to be done in order to know and, yeah because um, it's too big of a choice to make it's too big of a decision you... That's, that's a huge, huge issue. I mean, a lot of people, I think that we struggle as a society in talking about what quality of life means to us, but there are certain things that we all, a lot of us hold equally. And one of them is like the ability to enjoy food. Right? Um, it's the, a basic. The, yes. Yeah. It's a basic. Yeah, yeah. So, and if she, and mm -hmm. I kept saying, if she's going to aspirate and die from that, then let's let her die from that. Because what other quality does she have? I don't understand. Like what are, what? What this is not comfort care, but that yeah. comes down to liability. That comes. And so from I have a problem with hospice liable. and palliative, yeah. and I also have a problem. And maybe you can explain what is the difference between palliative yeah. and hospice. The difference that I found out, and you can you can you know ex, uh, expand on this, is that one Medicare covers and Medicaid covers different things under palliative as opposed to hospice. So they were happy to put her into hospice when she got back instead of trying to get her back to the base that she was but at. Palliative care is, you know, treat is, is, is care that's supposed to help determine what someone's quality of life means and, and improve their quality of life and maximize it, allowing for every treatment under the sun while doing that. Right. Um, and so it's, it is a, a fabulous service if you find the right company, right? And so that your person can, anybody with dementia should consider a palliative care evaluation is what I think. Um, because it will connect you to services and resources that you may not have known that you might need. Um, and you can still pursue all treatment options. Hospice right. is really more for someone's end of life. Now, good hospice services can also improve quality of life and people can live on hospice for years. So, yeah. but it is, it is, the question is asked to be approved for hospice. Like, would we be surprised if this person passed away within the next six months? And if the answer is no, we wouldn't be surprised, then they, you know, would be more likely to be approved for hospice. Um, right. But with hospice, the goal is any treatment, intervention, anything that you do is to provide comfort. And that's right. the main underlying goal of hospice. And palliative is just to maximize quality of life. Hospice is to do that as well, but that's the difference between them. But yeah, I mean, how they're paid for and covered, you know, that's, <sighs> that's a tough that's a tough thing. If you have a wound and um, you're, you know, y you need it to be addressed because it doesn't matter how long you're going to live. If you have a week 
or you have a year, it's your week and your year. Don't you agree? Mm-hmm. And that in that yeah. we all may have just a week. So we who has the right to say that, well, they only have a week to live, so who cares? Let's mm. just put them on morphine and knock them out. That's mm-hmm. not fair. That's not fair. It's mm-hmm. just not. And and there, there's a, a disconnect in communication between the surrogates. And the surrogates are often, and I'm not, I, I, I hesitate to say this because it's going to make me sound that I'm defensive, but I'm not. It, it, I hear it from other professionals that, you know, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on. And mm-hmm. so it becomes, you know, you are the problem. You're being, you're overstressed. You're not seeing reality. You're, you're. You're living you expect in it. too much. You expect too much, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and and you can be and so they can push you into that uh, stereotype box. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and, I and, can see that. Yeah, and it's not true because I and it took me so. I mean, I found a few allies, but I have I eventually became, and I'm I'm a gentle advocate. I have the disease to please, so I am the last person to go and look you, mother effers. That's my mom, you know. No, I'm like, um, so if, it, if, if it's okay, could you maybe send someone in? And my mom has gunk in her mouth that's like she can't even breathe because there's stuff blocking her airway. Just thought you might know how to get it out, you know. So, yeah. you know, and, and I just became the thorn in their, in their heel because they just didn't want to deal with it. And they're understaffed and, mm-hmm. um, and they just don't have the manpower. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like the root of the problem in, the, in a lot of the care and facilities. I think people have the best, some of the facilities really do have the best intentions and they just don't have the manpower for it. And that, and that is happening in hospitals as well. So it but, is, um, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, we've, we've lost a lot of workforce because of COVID and um, the stress of healthcare in providing this care. It, I mean, there are people that say that, uh, you know, people working in the ER and the hospital that we, we get PTSD and we have, you know, it is demoralizing to watch sometimes what happens to humans. And so that, that, that normalization of suffering and just seeing it over and over again, it can really harden people. And so I think that might be part of why you, why people get gaslit in a way is just because, you know, the people that are doing the gaslighting are just like, you know, I don't know what you want me to do in this situation. Like there's nothing I can really do. And, you're, you're coming at me with reasonable requests, but I can't actually take care of them for you because of X, Y, and Z issue on my end. And right. we don't know how to, we don't know how to provide what the best care for your person because of all these, all these variables and, and issues. So it's true. And it's systematic. I feel sorry it's, for yeah. you. Yeah. I do feel sorry for, for a lot of the healthcare workers like yourself and on a lot of doctors who have their hands tied because it's, it's down to protocol and it's down to again, liability and things like that, 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 that stand in the way of, of person centered care and yeah. individualized care and um you know and then also there's some care and then there are caregivers that aren't don't educate themselves and become and do become problems i know that i understand that too and that and they and i'm sure there are i don't doubt that there are people that you know come at people come at these facilities with with ridiculous expectations understood i understand that but there's got to be a middle level that we can meet and 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 that we need to take care of our healthcare workers like you. You, we need to provide, you know, therapy and and <laughs> we, no, seriously, just like we. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. To you know, minimize PTSD, which is really unhealthy, which can cause so many problems, which can you know manifest like Alzheimer's, like dementia, because it just takes over. Yeah, and, and so yeah, the fact that we don't. A incentivize our our you know people to come into the healthcare system. We don't, and we yeah. and we and we don't take care of the ones that are there. Yeah, there's definitely more work that needs to be done. I think that also. I think things will change. I think that the fact that we can have this conversation virtually and then get this information out into the world and impact people and. You know, the fact that we're, I, I'm a physician that is, has created an online course that 
that caregivers can take and consume on their own time to educate them. Like the fact that this is now a possibility and something that people are, I think, I just think people are more interested in spreading information and knowledge now. And I think a lot of physicians um, are looking to take back some of their autonomy and power, like in control of what we're actually doing in the healthcare system, because so many physicians have become employees that it is hard to advocate because you are concerned about losing your, your job. Um, and so that it's part of it. But I think, I think things will change. It's just disseminating information and, and talking and having conversations and, and shedding light on these issues. So like your documentary is going to be, you know, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic idea and something that is so needed. Um, Thank so. you. Yeah. When someone meets their person at the ER, what what can they do? What can how can they best advocate? What yeah communicates to you the best? Like when <laughs> someone's in there, how what can they say to you that 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 assures you that they're actually concerned in the right way? I think when caregivers show up physically in the emergency department and ask, you know, hey, can whenever the doctor or whoever has like a second to come and talk to my person, because remember there's nurse practitioners and physician assistants also working in the ER in conjunction with physicians. Um, you know, I just really would like to talk to them. I want to make sure that we're on the same plane, same page, that we're doing care that my person would want. I just want to make sure that we're following their goals and preferences and wishes. And I want to provide information so that you understand my person better and kind of know what's normal for them and not. And I think a lot of that you can communicate to the nurses that can then relay that information to physicians if they're super busy running around doing other things. Um, I did just recently write a blog post. I've written, I write a blog. I try to put it out every week. And a lot of it is about how to improve communication in the emergency department and with medical care staff in general. So I did do like a 10 tips for the ER. Oh, good. You know, yeah. So one of the things is that we really need to know the person has dementia because if you're there to help them make medical decisions and we don't know that, that they have dementia, that's a huge problem. And one of the issues I think people don't realize is that like nurses and techs are not sitting and like digging through your medical record. So they don't always know that the person has dementia if it's if it's not written in the record unless someone tells them. And so I know it's annoying when you come into the ER, you tell your story like six times. You tell it in registration. You tell it when they triage you. You then tell it when your nurse actually comes in. You tell it to the tech. You then eventually tell it to the doctor. And then you, you have to tell, tell the to... whole the whole next round that come in. <laughs> yeah. Then, yes. Anybody who's taking care of your patient in the hospital, your person in the yeah. hospital, you have to tell them too. And I know that it's frustrating, but every time a new person comes in, it's a it's another it's another way to advocate for your person, and it's another way to make sure that they're they're getting the care that that they would want. So, um, but I think letting us know is a big thing. And then I kind of also tell people like it's really important that you have an idea and understanding of your person's overall health and like right. what medical problems that they take, what medical problems that they have, and what medications that they take. It's really important because. To have a conversation about, you know, what's happening to them, you kind of have, have to have an underlying understanding of what, what their medical situation is. Right. Um, and so that's something I tell people to, to talk about. And then goals of care. Like, I can't talk about goals of care enough. And I teach three goals of care. Um, and it kind of goes in line with what we were talking about with code status. Yes. And so I teach... Goals of care, like your person wants every treatment under the sun to continue to prolong their life because they would be acceptable with their quality of life. Or there's someone who values the length of their life over quality of life. Because there are people out there who who want maximum medical treatment until it fails. And they don't care if their quality of life suffers with that. So that we have to respect that, right? It's not my job to tell you what to do. It's my job to give you the options. And then you make the best decision for yourself. So right. full treatment. And then on the other side, I teach that there's a goal of care of comfort. So every treatment and intervention that we do should be focused on comfort. And that doesn't mean no care. It means that, you know, if we're going to do a hip fracture report, repair surgery that is for comfort like yes, someone they, falls and fractures their hip they're never going to walk again unless we fix it and they right. may they may, their goal of care may be comfort but that doesn't mean that they can't come to the hospital and have surgery but right. that's important to know because say they have a severe infection and have sepsis and their goal of care is comfort well they they should not have maximum medical therapy to treat their sepsis because their goal of care is comfort and so, and it, I mean, and you talk about the different options there, but 
And then in the middle, the middle goal of care is I think where a lot of people fall is some but not all treatment. And so, you know, not receiving CPR is usually what would drop someone from full treatment into that goal of care category. But then literally, that's why people need a medical treatment plan, which is what I teach in my course, so that you can decide for each medical condition your person is at risk for, the most common things, what would you do now? So important. So important what she's saying is so important, you guys, because (laughs) I did change it from full code to do not resuscitate, which really only meant for me, my definition was don't do CPR and don't break her rib cage. I don't want her rib cage being broken, right, to resuscitate her. But that doesn't mean I don't want antibiotics for her Mm -hmm. sepsis and for her pneumonia. I Mm -hmm. I do want her to be suctioned so she can breathe. And doesn't mm-hmm. feel like she's suffocating. And there's a, there were certain things that I had that I wanted for her. And I had to fight for that. I had to fight for that because their default was, she'll be fine if we give her morphine. She won't feel like she, she can't. Don't worry about it. And I'd say, no, no, I, please, you have to listen to me. I know my mother. She, and then when I would talk to the respiratory specialist who came in, who, was, who would do the sectioning, and I asked him, will morphine help my mom feel like she is not being waterboarded? And he said, no, it won't. It's inhumane. She needs to be suctioned. So you must go with your gut, do your, do your yeah. research, and then do what you're saying, Brittany, is like, you know, do, do Brittany's course or do something <laughs> that where you do, where you do really define, de- definitively, you know, communicate what you want in these cases and you have to be specific, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is I, I think that the more that you can learn and the more knowledge that you have, then when you're in the moment, you're going to feel better about the choices that you make. You're not going to feel as guilty for making potentially making the wrong choice. You're going to be less likely to feel regretful and you're, you're going to like sleep better and just and feel like I didn't not be I pressured. Made, yeah. Not be pressured I, to make. You, yeah. Yeah, you but make one of the, the best decision yeah. that you could with the information that you have, you know, and one, you, can, one of and the you big, feel like yeah. you're advocating. One of the big, biggest challenges you talked about, you know, communicating whether first with the nurse, then to the, you know, is the availability of someone to communicate with due to staffing mm-hmm. shortages and just, just the amount of work that you, you are put under. You can't stop and talk to every person's family who comes in. I mean, Susie, I don't, if you're, if I'm not mistaken, like the first time your mom went in, you didn't talk to a doctor till the next morning and she went in early the night before. Um, oh, and, and you were in the, the dark, in, the, the, in the ER. That was yeah. the emergency one. The one in Tarzana. But even then, there's a lot of decisions yeah. that have to be made in that ER, and you didn't have any. You were in the dark. You I had begged. to have another to doctor, doctor yeah. ca- a friend of uh, your 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 nephew's friend's father, who was a doctor, call to talk to the doctor directly oh, because you had no idea what you, was going on, and have him explain it to you. I mean, it was. Yeah, that's, that's insanity. Oh, that is insanity. <laughs> and it's yeah. dangerous. And and I think that's due to, would you say that's due to staffing shortages or is that just the system? Uh, it's due to both. Hard I to mean, say, yeah. <laughs> you know, just like what happens in living facilities, like, you know, paying for people to be in there and take care of patients is very expensive. And uh, it's the same thing for staffing hospitals with, um, you know, and uh I, I mean, I'm not going to get into I'm not going to get into all the issues that I see in the emergency department um, because of what I do because it's what I do for a living, right? Um, I mean, I could talk to you that to talk to you all about that on, at a separate time, but yeah, I think that it part of it is staffing, and then it is like there's turnover, right? So a physician may have seen your your mom and put in orders and decided what they were going to do, and then said, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to her loved one later, like talk to you later, and then something else happened, and then it was the end of their shift and they left, and then there's a new doctor there now, and they know they really don't know anything about your mom. Yeah. They just know that your mom is not dying, and that they don't need to actively take care of her right now. Like she's tucked into the hospital, and that like, and so that's just unfortunately like that's kind of what's happening on the back end and I try I personally try to make a point to talk to the caregiver the person that's making medical decisions for my my patients that are living with dementia I I do that but I know that not every physician does that 
um, it, because it matters to me that I start the care that they would want because the care gets started in the emergency department. We start critical care. We can start comfort care. We can we, we set the kind of tone for what the hospital stay looks like in a lot of situations. Um, so I think just being an advocate, being there physically, and I think asking, you know, you just have to keep asking, like, hey, I know they're super busy, but, like, is there any way someone could come and just talk to me for, like, three minutes about what is going on? And you just – I always tell people, like, kill the staff with kindness. Like, and I, I don't know how else to tell people to do it, but just, just keep asking, um, you know, and being nice and saying, I know that you're busy. I know. But, like, I'm here and I just really want to talk to somebody. Or yeah. can they call me, you know? Yeah, because, you know, there's always the, oh, the squeaky wheel gets, you know, the oil – you know, and some people go quite the opposite and, you know, basically go terms of endearment on everybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, they think that, well, I'll get, but you feel, obviously, and it may be the person you are, the way better way is to be nice and p decent and pleasant. But sometimes I feel like you don't get noticed. Sometimes they're like, yeah. oh, they're nice. I don't have to deal with them right now. They're, exactly. they're okay. You know, so yeah. that's a hard it's, decision. It depends. <laughs> yeah, it definitely depends. Yeah. Wow, this is a big this is a big topic. It's a huge conversation. Um, there's just, there, there's a lot to unpack here because I, I I've been through it and I know, you know, and it does and it is, it's a it's a person to person situation. I love yeah. that you I love your advice about alerting people to the fact that your person has Alzheimer's or dementia because we forget and we do. I did think that, you know, well, it's in, isn't it in their files? You know, don't you see it? But no, I mean, that's why my mom ended up in a wheelchair because when she went to a doctor's appointment and she was agitated, they thought she had a, a mental breakdown and put her in psych lockup and gave her Depakote oh. for seven days. And because they didn't know that she had Alzheimer's mm -hmm. at, the hosp at the place that was her doc her regular hospital. So people mm -hmm. don't look. People don't look, they often don't have time. You can't, you, I think you're really right in saying you can't assume that anyone knows. No, 100%. You can't assume. That's um, so important. I always, I always think when I go to the doctor, oh, they've looked up all my files. <laughs> they know everything. They know my whole history and quite the opposite. Yeah. It's time consuming. And yeah. that's like in the doctor's office before they see you for a regular visit, they probably have reviewed your record. But in Sometimes. the hospital, <laughs> yeah, I would hope, you know, but in the hospital, um, you know, you come into the ER, I skim through the, the what's in there, but it's not always complete. And I don't always have time to go back and read, you know, some people's charts are like so many pages, so For much sure. Clicking. For sure. And you have, to, and your goal is to get that person stable. Right. Correct? It's, yeah, exactly. So we look for you know, what is, what is most likely happening based on the symptoms that they're coming in for. And then also like thinking about the worst possible thing that, that could be and what could, what could potentially negatively affect their quality of life and harm them if we miss it, what tests do we need to do? So yeah, it's, it's, and it's all based on who's sickest, right? So it's whoever's sickest gets seen right then. And we're constantly being interrupted, which, which we all know, like task switching is not good for our brains. And that's how things get, that's how things get forgotten. Like you get forgotten to bring a blanket to, you don't get your pillow. You don't, you know, they say they're going to come back and then where are they? They're not back. Well, it's because they probably forgot because they got distracted doing a bunch of other things. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's that's a why place. I played music really loud in the, in the room when <laughs> I played my mom's music and they're like, wow, who's that singing? It's my mom. I had any trick I could do to get attention. <laughs> I mean, people, people loved it. It worked. No, I'm just, I'm making a joke, but in a way, but not really. But the point is, is that you're right, that it, we have to assume that, that everyone is distracted and busy and, um, and, and gosh, I think what you're saying is like the best, the best, you know, way to, to, to the, to avoid these problems is to be prepared. Yeah. To walk I'm just trying prepared. to. Just trying to decrease people's stress by teaching them like what they might not know, like filling in gaps of knowledge ahead of time. And I like I don't want to tell people what to do. I just want to 
provide this perspective that we have from the medical side of things so that people are armed with the information so they can make informed choices. So great. So. I love what you're doing, Brittany. I think what you're yeah. doing is, no, it's so, it's so, so, so important. It really is. It's like, I, it's required. If you're, if you yeah. are a, a caregiver, if you are the, the person conservator of the person's health, you must do that for them and for yourself. That will alleviate so much problems on both sides. And, and I wish that I had known that, but you know, now I do. And, and now and in, there's a place where everyone can go. They can go to your website and find out all about yeah. how to be prepared. Yeah. It's blammd.com. Well, yeah, it's going to be in the, in the show notes. You'll find it for sure. But I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't usually promote, we don't usually promote, we just have conversations, but I think what you're doing is really great. And I think it's important. And I think, you know, having someone that's been in the trenches like you with, and it can speak from experience can, it can be an invaluable service to all of us. So thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to, happy to help. And, you know, people don't have to pay for my course. They can, you know, can read my blog and, uh, join my Facebook community and I go live in there, I try to go live in there weekly and answer questions and things too. So there's stuff oh, I'm pay, doing Go for pay for your, co go pay for her course. <laughs> yeah, people, get, people need to get paid, you guys. We want Brittany to have money. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, happy to help people in the course as well. Great. So. Well, wonderful. thank you so much. You're a del delightful human being. You're a lovely human being and I, I love your soul. And I think that what you're doing is a, is wonderful and that you're taking the time to, to, you know, multitask like you're doing because you're do you're juggling a lot. So thank you. No, it's helped me. I honestly feel like uh, being in this space has taught me a lot. It has helped me better care for my people who are living with dementia. And I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. It's making me happier at work. So it's a win-win. <laughs> beautiful. That's, That's so beautiful. We're all about that. Aren't we Don? Yeah, absolutely. We we are we are all about that. You know, we're, what I was really excited about today is that I finally got to call a Dr. Lammy Pie. Yeah. <laughs> Who isn't? <laughs> Very excited that. I, we want to thank Lammy Pie. <laughs> <laughs> and she is a MD. <laughs> yeah, that's the series. We're going to develop a series. Lammy Pie. Lammy Pie MD. MD. <laughs> Well, it's, we, we do love what you're doing, and that's what we're all about is love. And there's one reason for that, and that is because love is powerful, love is contagious, and love conquers alls. And we thank everyone for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, go to Brittany's website, get yourself all good for the future, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to see you next time. Get prepared, thank you so much. kiss your loved ones, and have a great day. Bye, everybody. Take, take care, everyone. <laughs>